My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Catholic Business Network, CBN, is very happy to present to you our annual Lantern Retreat 2020. This retreat is being done online due to the current COVID-19 situation. This online retreat will be available on CBN's YouTube for you to use in the comfort of your homes or any other suitable locations. The theme of this year's retreat is Choice and Change at Work. And the retreat master is Reverend Father Colin Tan, Spiritual Director of CBN. The program for the retreat is as follows. We will kick off with a praise and worship session conducted by the Santo Nino Music Ministry. Father Colin will then conduct the opening talk followed by reflection questions which will allow you to spend some quiet time with the Lord individually or in small groups. We encourage you to meet in groups with your families or friends or colleagues to do this retreat together during this 2020 season of Lent. Father Colin will then do the second talk followed by reflection questions. We will then have the second praise and worship session conducted by the Santo Nino Music Ministry. Father Colley will then wrap it up with a third talk, followed by reflection questions. The entire program will take around three to four hours, but you can either watch it in one go or break it up as per your convenience over multiple sessions. We hope you find this retreat valuable and we look forward to doing more online talks or retreats in the future. CBN is a self-funded non-profit organization and we need your support to continue to bring more programs and events to you. At the end of this program, we have information for you to make love offerings in order to help CBN defray some of the costs of this online retreat. We thank you for your support. So let's kick off this retreat with our first praise and worship session. Brothers and sisters, please join with us in glorifying the Lord with our songs and praises. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your unwavering protection and love to all of us. That in despite of this fearful news happening around the world, and in the midst of this COVID-19 virus outbreak, we can still find peace and love in you. Dear Father, may the chaos of the world will not derail our faith, our trust, and our love in you. And as we remember the 10,000 reasons and more,
worship your name, O God, O King of kings, and Lord of lords. With the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Our Lord, our stronghold, our rock and our foundation. We give you thanks, Father, for your greatness and goodness, Lord God. Thank you so much, Lord, for everything. Thank you so much, Lord, for all your providence, Lord God. Lord Jesus, while you are here on earth, you also experience challenges and trials even more than what we are experiencing currently. But you face them bravely, O oh God, with total surrender and obedience to your heavenly Father. Teach us, dear God, to be like you, to be fearless, to stand and to provide.
brave to stand against temptation, to stand against the word of God. Heavenly Father, as we continue with our Lenten retreat, be God will send His Holy Spirit to each and every one of us through the words of our speaker and sink in into our hearts. Amen. Amen. O glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world, world without end. end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So uh, thank you, first of all, for the uh, choir that has just given us uh, such an uplifting song. Uh, we know that uh, we thank the Santo Nino group. At the same time, we want to thank you for being present to us, but in a special way because we know that uh, the retreat has been cancelled from the Kingsmead Hall Centre because of uh, the COVID-19. And as a result, we have to make special arrangements for this retreat to be video recorded. So you are in a way uh, present to us in a spirit that the Lord will guide you where you are. And if you recall, last uh, year we had also another Lenten retreat organized by the Catholic Business Network. And the theme uh, was walking in faith. And indeed, you are asked to walk in faith today. And especially we know that um, things are so uncertain, things are changing, and we have to make so many choices to change our lives, to change the way we work, to change even the way we see ourselves and the way we see God. So interestingly, I think this is what maybe the retreat can help us to understand the theme of what I would like to present to you about choice and change at work. And indeed, I would like to invite you to take through this retreat as a time of grace a time in which you can journey with God, a time in which you know that God is present to you and not abandon us even in the midst of changes and uncertainty and even at times confusion and at times fear. And so this is, I think, a time for us to search deep in our hearts to know where is God present to me? Where is God in my world? Where is God inviting me? to really refocus my relationship with God and at the same time to know how I can be an agent of change in the world. So on that note, I would like to take you through the three sessions that I will be uh, conducting for the whole day of retreat. So I invite you to be with me as the three sessions uh, starting with the first one will be God's choice to enter into our world God's presence and love. And the second session will be our Christian response, God's covenant and the choices we face. And the last session for our retreat will be transforming the world by the choice that we make to change ourselves. So these are the three themes that I will take you through for the retreat that we're going to have. So we, before we get into the sessions, um, let me uh, just perhaps have a preamble to understand how choices and change are parts of our lives and in which we recognize that as we look into our lives, there are sometimes some decisions that we make will be called good decisions. There are some decisions that we make that perhaps we may look back and we may have some regrets. Perhaps we know that choices that we make will always be in response to challenges in life. It will be in response to difficulties and problems that we face. And sometimes it can be also due to a crisis that may enter our lives. And as a result, we may have to make adjustments to a certain uh, tragic event or when we feel ourselves being thrown into the deep end, and when we are invited to search, what is it that in me that I need to respond to the new situation, to the new demands, 
and even sometimes to a new direction which God is directing me. And we see that all the time of how we never take life for granted. And life is never static for that matter. There is always the dynamic of change. There's always the dynamic of growth. There's always the dynamic in which we know that every stage of our lives, we are called to be transformed, become something of the beauty, something of uh, the person that God wants us to be. And sometimes, you know, um, there's a beautiful way in which we see uh, the story of the, the emerging uh, chrysalis that will turn into a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. And then for the butterfly to be a beautiful butterfly, it has to morph into slowly from being a little worm and then becoming a cocoon to wrap itself up after eating and eating and then becoming later emerging as a chrysalis so that it will be able to become a butterfly eventually. And each stage of its metamorphosis requires a dying to itself before uh, something else can emerge. And I think that is perhaps a good imagery for us to consider when God calls us to change, we also need to die to ourselves, die to some parts of us that can be a hindrance to how we should move on to the next stage of our lives. Perhaps sometimes we have to die to our habits if we are so used to doing certain things in a certain way, then sometimes that can itself be an obstacle and it can indeed be a hindrance in our ability to adapt to change. I'm sure we know very well there are so many examples. The change that is demanded now of us is the fact that we are so used to attending Mass on Sunday and then with this present COVID-19 crisis, the Archbishop has, of course, suspended all masses. And as a result, a lot of people now have to make changes regards to how they see their faith, how they're going to live without receiving the Eucharist on Sunday, and even for some very good devout Catholic to receive the Eucharist on the daily basis. And so they will need to then say, what does it mean for me then to sustain my faith in the midst of this change? Do I then now dwell deeper and be nourished by the Word of God? Do I now take my prayer life more seriously so that I can still be connected to God in a very special and personal way? Do I also make changes where I can perhaps now nourish my faith with a group of uh, believers, be they in the family, be they with a Christian community, in your NCC groups, be they with uh, those friends of yours whom you gather together and you can still pray together. So these are some of the ways in which how a crisis can affect the habitual way in which we live our daily lives. In fact, I remember coming to church and feeling a little bit lost on Sunday because it was totally different. It was unusual. It was not my normal habit because I could no longer see the regular attendees at Mass. I could no longer meet the familiar faces and to say hello to them. The church was empty. The church was quiet. The church was, as it were, almost deserted except for a pocket of individuals who came to pray. So even for me, that change uh, requires of me to understand where is God inviting me to also see that there is a need now to reflect on my faith, to reflect on my relationship with people, to reflect even on my own vocation as a priest when I am not in the position to celebrate the Holy Eucharist with the faithful people of God. So you see that um, very often when there is the midst of crisis, there's also a call and a grace given to be able to change so that something better may emerge, 
something in which we say is the spiritual beauty of the butterfly that is waiting for us to be released. And so my dear friends, uh, in many ways, I would like to invite you then to join me to say a little prayer together as we also begin the session. And the prayer here uh, is a wonderful prayer uh, by a Jesuit who was a former general of the Society of Jesus, uh, Father Pedro Arupe. So do join me to say this prayer as we begin our retreat. Teach me your way of looking at people as you glance at Peter after his denier and as you penetrated the heart of the rich young men and the hearts of your disciples. I would like to meet you as you really are, since your image changes those with whom you have come into contact. Remember John the Baptist's first meeting with you and the centurion's feeling of unworthiness and the amazement of all those who saw miracles and other wonders. How you impress your disciples the rabbi in the Garden of Olives, Pilate and his wife and the centurion at the foot of the cross. I would like to hear and be impressed by your manner of speaking, listening, for example, to your discourse in the synagogue in Capernaum or the Sermon on the Mount where your audience felt you taught as one who has authority. We make all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so I think this prayer uh, invites us to encounter Jesus in our retreat in a personal way so that Jesus is actually walking with you so that Jesus is helping you to gain insights, helping you to open our minds and hearts to where God is working in your life. And indeed, God is always present to us in ways that are always surprising, in ways that sometimes we do not know where to go, in ways in which it will catch us by surprise in a sense that we may not be ready for it, and yet the Lord will say to you, Come, I have called you. All you have to do is to respond, to say yes or to say no. And so this is always a challenge of how we are able to find God present in our lives as is the practical discernment of uh, the Ignatian spirituality where we're invited always to see how God enters into our lives to guide us, to direct us, to inspire us, and at the same time, to help us enter more fully into, we say, uh, the spirituality that is rooted in being able to find God in every situation of our lives and in every challenges in which we encounter uh, our either difficulties or at times even crisis in life. So if there's anything I would say that to be human is to be able to grow in greater insight, greater understanding, and indeed a greater love for God in our lives. If you want to put it this way, we can say to be human is to be able to attend to the mystery whom we call God in our lives. A God who is interested in our well-being, a God who wants us to share his friendship, a God who leads us into life, and a God who continues to help us grow to become not just more human, but more divine. I think this is the beauty in which we see God's creative presence in our world. And maybe to help us uh, enter and perhaps even at times um, try to uh, grapple with this mystery of God, I would suggest uh, three words that can help us explore 
the mystery of God in our lives. And these three words are then, intent, and to extend. And I think I will explain this in terms of a text that may help us. It's a text in which we see uh, Abraham encountering uh, also the mystery of God. But at the same time, there is also another text that I have, which is actually the burning bush from Exodus chapter 3. And I shall read this to you. <clears throat> Moses was looking after the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led it to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him in the flame, blazing from the middle of the bush. Moses looked, and there was the bush burning and blazing. But the bush was not being burnt up. Moses said, I must go across and see this strange sight and why the bush is not burnt up. When Yahweh saw him going across to look, God called to him from the middle of the bush Moses, Moses, he said. Here I am, he answered. Come no nearer, he said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your ancestors, he said. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses covered his face, for he was afraid to look at God. My dear friends, um, we can take um, many layers of uh, meaning from this uh, encounter of Moses with the Divine Presence. You know the context uh, of this encounter is that Moses was a fugitive who fled from Egypt after he killed one of the Egyptians. And so he was probably feeling lost, feeling remorseful, feeling that he carries with him a burden, a burden of guilt, maybe a burden of uh, shame, and even a burden of being a failure. So it is in this context that we have how God decided to intervene in his life. How God appeared to him and called him for a mission and we know very well that mission is to deliver his people from the bondage and slavery of injustice under Pharaoh in Egypt. And I can imagine that he had already escaped from Pharaoh and then now God is asking him to go back. Anyone who has some sense would say thanks but no thanks. So truly, God sometimes can work in very surprising ways. God invites us to overcome all our fears, all our reservations, and all our guilt and even shame. It is not easy, I think, humanly for us to be able to encounter God and to say, yes, I will go, because humanly we would say, no thanks. Uh, I'm running away from someone who's trying to kill me. You want me to go back to be killed again? Surely uh, that's not our normal thinking. And indeed, if there's anything that helps us, it is 
the ability to now see that we are invited to now tend to the holy, tend to where is the divine at work in our lives. You know how it's like for some people who have a certain hobby, just like myself, where uh, I like to tend to plants, to flowers, to fruit trees. When you tend to them, you pay special attention to them. You look after them. You water them. You protect them even. And of course, one day, you'll be very happy to experience the fruits of your tending to them. Could be the beauty of a flower that has blossomed that will give you such joy. Or it can be even sometimes the fruits that uh, the plants, will, the fruit trees will give to you. It can be a papaya, it can be a durian, it can be a chiku. Any of those fruits will give us such joy that you know is not the same if you to buy them from the supermarket. So there is something wonderful in which we are connected to the fundamental providence of God in our lives. How God, when we tend to God's creation, God will also be present to us. So just as uh, Moses was tending to the flock of his father-in-law, God was at the same time luring him to the mountain of God, to Mount Horeb. And that is where the burning bush phenomenon became a point of encounter also very much in our own lives. Where would be a place that we say is sacred, that we have to take off our shoes because the ground that we are standing is holy ground. Maybe it can be the workplace that we are at. Maybe that is one good approach to understanding. If God calls you to be where you are, tending to your work, then that is the holy ground in which you will encounter God. It takes us simply to be aware, to be aware that there is the holy divine presence at work. And when you can see that, then that perspective will change the way you approach work. Work is not going to be something of a daily routine. It's not something that you drag your feet to go to the office. It's not something you do because you say, I have to earn a living to support my family. It's not about money. It's not about ambition. It's not about also, for that matter, your own personal satisfaction. There's something greater at work. We call that a mission. So you have to see that work must therefore uh, carry with it a certain divine mission that God has invited you to be where you are. When you can see that, then you know how you can change yourself, how you can change the world, and also to know that you are not alone, that if God has called you for a purpose and for a mission, God will provide the means necessary for you to accomplish that mission. And so tending to the holy is an invitation for us to truly know that we, every Christian, we are concerned, we are called to imitate Christ. Christ who has come not to do His own will, but the will of His Father. And so therefore, if you can see that what you do is a purpose and mission entrusted to you and to you alone, that nobody else has been placed in that job, in that company, in the work that you accomplish, then you will see yourself transform. You will see now maybe a different approach to working, that you can perhaps now see the divine hand of God guiding you, helping you to overcome all the difficulties and challenges and even problems that will arise in every situation. And then you will know that you will be able to find a solution, that you will be able to treat your fellow workers, your colleague, with respect and love, 
and to know that when the Spirit of God is at work, everything will work out well. Everything will have its purpose and solution and that everything will work according to God's will and purpose for you. So for us, we need to then come to the fundamental understanding of intention. To intend is looking into what is at the heart of every human being, meaning how is it that we are able to have a certain understanding, certain thinking, and certain even, uh, we say, um, our purpose in which we do certain things. Is my intention to work simply to make more money? Or is my intention to make the world a better place? Is my intention to build the company so that I can provide more jobs? Or if uh, there is a certain corporate mission, then it could be say, what is really the vision and mission statement of the company in which you work? There must always be something larger than yourselves, something of uh, the transcendence to make this world a better place. Um, I think we recognize this when we do something good for other people. There's a sense of self-transcendence. Maybe that's what it is. That means to say, we always will what is good for the other. We will the well-being of the person whom we work for. Maybe your colleague, maybe even your boss. Can that encounter transform that person, make that person become a better place? Maybe the person can become more patient, can the person be more loving, can the, the person be even uh, be more kind and more compassionate towards each other, towards uh, the work that they do, and to treat each other with respect and dignity. So the intention, as we know, of a person will then be translated into their daily actions into how they see themselves and how they see the world. So a good way to always ask ourselves in our counter with people is to ask this question, do people have good intentions or evil intentions? Is my intention pure and honourable? Is my intention honest and holy? These are some ways that we can truly spend some time to reflect on the second point of intention of the heart. And therefore, we know that God uh, recognizes uh, that God has a certain intention for us. And that is to say, God wills us into life. God wills us into life in spite of our cruelty, even our wickedness. As in Ezekiel chapter 18 will tell us. We can see how God tells us, I do not desire the death of the wicked, but that he may turn from his wicked ways and have life or will live. So there is something of the reading into the heart and the mind of God, and therefore God's intention. God's intention has always to draw us to himself, just as God drew Moses to himself, and that drawing to God's self transforms us. When we are in the presence of someone who has certain moral values, a certain maybe qualities about them, we know that we admire those qualities. And how very often, if you have a uh, a chance to meet your favorite uh, uh, hero. Maybe you ask yourself who that person would be. I know I had a privilege to that time meet uh, Mother Teresa when she came to Singapore. And of course, uh, uh, you know, all of us were very excited to be able to meet Mother Teresa, whom we know that she has a reputation for holiness but at the same time also someone who has such a, a heart for the poor. Her intention of being able to 
reveal the face of God to the poor. And to be able to see, to love them, is to love God. It's such a profound way of uh, seeing the dignity and the respect in every human person. I remember that when I had a chance to see her, I was really very impressed by her simplicity, by her humility, and also by her own holiness. And one of those stories that she uh, told when I uh, remember some of the encounters was um, there was one man who at the meeting was pressing uh, Mother Teresa uh, about how some Christians have resorted to violence and even taking up arms uh, in some countries where there is great injustice. So this man pressed Mother Teresa for an answer. Mother, what do you say to these people? You know, some of them are even priests and they take up arms, you know, to fight uh, injustice, corrupt governments, and because they are trying to maybe even change the system and structure of those countries. So Mother Teresa turned to him and said, I cannot tell them what to do. I only know that they had to follow their conscience. And I also know that Violence is not always the answer. I do not condemn them. I leave them to God. I don't uh, have any way to tell them how to act. I only do what I can. I try to do my best to serve God, to love God. And I hope you'll do the same. So I thought I was very impressed by Mother Teresa's answer in response to that man who apparently was uh, quite uh, upset and was even pressing for maybe some condemnation of the, of the acts of these people. So if there's anything we need to really reflect on, it would be our own intentions. If we ask ourselves, what is my intention when God calls me? Then my intention is always to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And it means sometimes dying to ourselves, dying to our comfort, dying to our own uh, needs, and even dying to sometimes uh, our own ideas about how things should be done. Not my plan, but God's way and God's means that will help us. So we have uh, the next point that we can look into on how we can encounter the mystery of the Divine Presence at work in our lives, and which is to extend. And this extension of, of hospitality is to know that we are invited to welcome people, that we are invited to know that hospitality is the way in which we treat people with respect, hospitality rather than hostility. Very often, you know, even in this uh, very challenging times, uh, if you were to travel to some countries which unfortunately may think that you are a potential carrier of the COVID-19 virus, they may treat you with disdain. They may even treat you uh, with a tinge of racism. Oh, you look Chinese. Are you from, um, from China? Then, of course, you tell them, no, 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 I'm not from China, I'm from Singapore. Oh, Singapore, oh, you're also a country where we uh, may not uh, welcome you. So, we, we encounter all those situations where at times, hospitality is not going to be the norm. And yet, it is our Christian duty to always remember how to extend welcome, how to extend help, and to extend even uh, you know, assistance to people who are sick, who are needy, who are poor, who perhaps are even at times uh, late, neglected uh, to die. And that's why for us, there is nothing like the call of a Christian to be hospitable. We say that uh, as we know, um, the basis of our hospitality is very much in our Christian tradition. And you know the beautiful story 
of the encounter of uh, Abraham, uh, where he welcomed the three visitors. And because he did that, he was able to become a friend of God. So it's interesting uh, in this text that some of you may have a chance uh, to get into. It's from Genesis uh, chapter 18. Um, and then somehow the three visitors that uh, came by, they were people who perhaps were strangers. And yet Abraham extended welcome hospitality to them. In this text, you will see um, how the Abraham was uh, resting on on a very hot day under under oak of memory, and um, he was sitting at the entrance of his tent when these three visitors came by, and immediately he said, "My Lord, if I find favor with you." Please do not pass your servant by. Let me have a little water brought and you can wash your feet and have a rest under the tree. Let me fetch a little bread and you can refresh yourselves before going further. Now that you have come to your servant's direction, they reply, do as you say. So there is something wonderful about this uh, perfect example of hospitality given by uh, Abraham at that time, not Abraham yet, to these three visitors. And we always say in our Christian tradition that when we welcome strangers, we may at times unknowingly and without realizing it, welcome the divine presence itself. So we know in many um, Christian countries, they had that tradition. I remember when I was in, in Ireland, they have this tradition of the houses out in the remote places where at night they would place a candle at the window. So I was a bit uh, surprised that they would keep that light on throughout the night. And then when I asked why do they do that, they simply tell me very simply that it is because when, in case any traveller were to travel in darkness to that part of the world, they would at least see a light in the house and be able to go to that house and seek some shelter or to get water or to even get rest for the night. So um, this is really something uh, which I was very impressed. And indeed, this goes back to the hospitality of Abraham, we encountered the three divine persons. And we see this as a very important part of how God would then extend the covenant to Abraham. And this is part of the way when we say yes to God, when we extend hospitality to God and extend hospitality to people who are needy, then something will change in us as well something also will be given to us. Maybe uh, the covenant that God has uh, entered with His people is very simple, that God will become our God and we become His people. I think that is a beautiful exchange, exchange of the divine welcome with human uh, hospitality. So my dear friends, uh, these are some of the points that uh, we are invited to look into in our lives. And of course in scripture, we have Matthew chapter 5, uh, where our Lord uh, also invites us to imitate the distinct quality of the divine. And one of which of course is, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Matthew chapter 5 verse 38 onwards. And in another translation, uh, it's not so much perfection, but be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. So we look into this meaning of what does it uh, 
bring us to share that perfection of holiness. And um, I remember reading um, a book by uh, St. Teresa of Avila. And in that book, uh, The Interior Castle, I was struck by a line that she says uh, in terms of advice to her sisters on how to pray. She said, Perfection does not consist in more consolation, but an increase in love. So I think if there's a way we connect to this text and the quotation, is that if we want to be holy, if we want to be perfect, then it simply demands of us to increase our love, increase our love for each other, increase our love for God. That is perfection. And so, my dear friends, um, we know that this time is a time that you can spend uh, some moments of solitude, moments of prayer, moments in which you can truly encounter the divine in your lives. So I would uh, invite you to uh, be able to now consider spending some time to pray, some time in which you can uh, use whichever method of prayer that you know uh, to enter into uh, quiet, into reflection, into meditating, what it means for you to tend, to intend, and to extend. The acronym is TIE, T-I-E. Yeah? So how are you tied to God? How is God tied to you? And when you have a certain tie, well, it means that you have certain relationship. So God invites us to enter into a very personal relationship with Him during this retreat that you're entering into. So I would like to just maybe um, suggest also another way of praying, which is the Ignatian um, spirituality or Ignatian method of contemplation. Um, <clears throat> simply putting it this way, um, there are certain steps that you uh, can take note of. The first is the preparation for prayer. So when you have the already settled down, prepare yourself, find a quiet place that you can pray, set the time that you need to pray, uh, try to minimize any distractions, to be able to stay focused, to be relaxed, and to remind yourself that you are standing on holy ground. So that is the awareness of the presence of God. And then you ask for grace before you begin your retreat. And so I would like to suggest a, a grace that um, you should ask for yourself in this first session. And the grace that um, I'm uh, pre presenting and suggesting to you is this, that we ask for the grace to see and respond to the wonders and mystery of God's awesome, loving presence in the world. So that will be um, at the back of your mind as you enter into prayer to be able to see, to respond to the wonders, to the awesomeness and the mystery of God's presence in our world and in your lives and maybe in your work. So that is what you like to focus on. And then um, another part of uh, the prayer as you uh, continue is to go into the prayer proper meaning to say you um, enter into the time, the former time of prayer. In the spiritual exercises, uh, St. Ignatius invites uh, pilgrims and retreatants to use their imagination to make the gospel scene come alive, to make the encounter real. For example, if it's about the burning bush, you recognize that yeah, there is the, something of a fire that you are suddenly uh, taken by surprise how there's a bush that is on fire. Uh, I think we, doesn't, we don't have to um, have uh, a lot of imagination for that. These days we've been uh, talking about the bush fire in Australia. Huh? There have been a lot of pictures about how uh, you know, trees have been you know, uh, set on fire. Uh, 
So maybe something of that, and maybe you can use one example of uh, some bushes on fire. And of course here is the fire of divine presence. It's a fire that seems to be the uh, symbol of the presence of God, even as you remember how uh, God led the people out of slavery and crossing uh, the Red Sea when the sea was parted. A column of fire and the cloud also led the people. The column of fire uh, lighting up at night. So there is a very biblical understanding of fire as uh, symbolic of the divine presence and especially when something uh, important is to be revealed. So you can use your imagination to help you enter more fully into your prayer time. And um, what is important for us is to know that as you enter into prayer, you're invited to have a close personal encounter with Jesus our Lord. As St. Ignatius would say, that you may have an intimate knowledge of our Lord who has become man for me, that I may love him more and follow him more closely. So in other words, as you enter into the prayer using the gospel, you are trying to see and sense who is this person, Jesus, who is present to me. So every gospel text is about you and your encounter with the Lord. What is the Lord inviting you to do? What is the Lord saying to you? What is the Lord maybe entrusting to you in terms of a mission? So uh, for, for you to be able to tune into that, you need to be uh, attentive, you need to uh, look at the intentions of your hearts, you need to extend yourself to be open to enter what might be strange and what might be the unknown. So it is something of an adventure to walk with the Lord and to also fall in love with the Lord. So this would be um, roughly uh, the prep of proper that you have. Set yourself a time as you are engaged in the context of the text. You can maybe see the situation, the conversation, uh, the persons that are there, the moods. Uh, so whatever helps you, you can use this method to enter into prayer. And the final part of that prayer proper is uh, what we call a conversation. That means you speak to the Lord as you speak to a friend, just as uh, Moses spoke to the voice of God, you know. Who are you, you know, yeah. Um, so uh, we call this conversation sometimes a colloquy. So we can also speak to any of the characters that are present. It can be maybe Peter, it can be Joseph, it can be Our Lady Mary, wh whichever the setting is. And then you normally end off with your formal prayer well, with uh, maybe a simple devotional prayer like the Our Father, One Hail Mary, or you can even say uh, any kind of personal prayers that you have uh, to end the prayer. And you can of course uh, say a word of prayer to thank the Lord for the time that you have been able to spend with the Lord. And the final part of uh, this uh, structure of prayer is what we call the review of prayer. Meaning to say you spend about maybe 5-10 minutes to look back at the prayer experience and to notice if uh, there have been some movements in the spirit, the, some changes, some insight, uh, maybe also some uh, awareness of where God has been guiding you and helping you and directing you during that time of prayer that time of quiet and silence and that time of uh, really, uh, we say, uh, quiet solitude and being contemplatively present to the Lord. So that is uh, the review of prayer that you can have. Uh, then some simple questions, maybe just to take note of the feelings. How did you feel before the prayer, during the prayer and after the prayer? Did you feel distracted? Did you feel yourself to be maybe uh, in a state of uh, despair? Uh, were you maybe sleepy or tired? And then as you pray, then did you notice any change in your feelings? Did you feel consoled? Did you feel joyful? Did you feel hopeful? So you take note of all these feelings uh, in the review of prayer. And um, so now I would like to give you a uh, 
some suggestions on the text for prayer. Um, we have two texts that you could maybe use. One is uh, Moses and the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3. All right. And then the second one is uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 33 to 48, which is about uh, how Jesus sets a new, newer standard, a higher standard for us to follow as his disciples. It's about where um, Jesus tells you, if anybody asks you for a tunic, you give your cloak as well. If anybody slaps you on the cheek, you turn the other cheek as well. If anybody asks you to go one mile, you go the extra mile. And so this is a really a wonderful text uh, to help us go beyond our natural human comfort zone. And even at times, uh, our own uh, you know, revulsion against uh, what we say is our own self-survival uh, mechanism that we would uh, instinctively want to strike back at somebody who lays a hand on us. And yet the Lord is telling us something very extraordinary, something that demands of us to transcend our human selfishness, our own uh, human instinct for survival. Uh, so there's something maybe the Lord is inviting us to transform in us, to put away any obstacles that stand in the way of changing to become better persons that the Lord has intended us. So for your questions that you can take uh, with you um, when you're also praying would be these three questions. Uh, the first question is, what are the criteria I use for making decisions or choices in life? So that would be a first question that you can uh, consider during the time that you're praying. And the second question that you like to uh, look into is uh, who informs or influences my worldviews, values, and choices in life? And the third question that you can also take for your prayer is how have I experienced God's presence and love in my life? So that will uh, be the three questions. Uh, if it helps you, uh, you can use them. If it doesn't help you, go where the Spirit leads you. I would leave you with the time to pray. And, uh, you know, for us, uh, it is important to have that ability to be quiet, ability to be silent, and ability to enter into the divine presence of God. I will just uh, end up with an uh, you know, uh, interesting um, story about uh, a novice who went to a monastery. So there was a novice who wanted to uh, join the monastic life. So he went there and uh, at first he was very enthusiastic, but gradually he found it very difficult to keep silent, uh, to pray uh, all the hours with the monks, uh, and even to um, eat the food that they have, which was very plain and very simple. Um, so, at the, uh, the experience did not go well for the, this novice. And then, the tradition of the um, monastery is that um, you are allowed to speak three words to the abbot. So after one week, the novice had a chance to meet the abbot and said three words, food no good. And then the abbot listened silently, nodded and blessed him and left. The second week, the novice came again and said, Bed too hard. And then the abbot listened to him patiently, nodded, and then blessed him and left. And then the third time, the novice said, I cannot pray. The abbot listened to him and then nodded, blessed him, and then before he left, he said, now 
it's my turn to say three words to you. And you know what the abbot said? The abbot said, you may live. <laughs> so, so when, um, when uh, people find it difficult, uh, God uh, will not you know, hold us back. But nonetheless, we know that uh, there is something wonderful also in which there is the hospitality of God that is always at work. God will always welcome us. God will always uh, continue to hold us in the space that will help us to be safe, help us to be secure, and help us to feel that we are loved by God. And that is all that it takes for us to enter into prayer, to feel the loving presence of God in your lives. So I leave you now to uh, spend uh, about half an hour or more, if you can, for your own quiet time and for your own prayer. And I'll see you at the next session. God bless you. So uh, welcome back again uh, from our first session that you have had and I hope that you have been able to enter into uh, some kind of uh, reflection, some time to pray, some time to be in solitude with the Lord. And I think most of all it will be to understand that each time when we enter into prayer, as we know, it's not about what we are doing at prayer but rather what God is doing with us and for us during the time that we spend with God in prayer. So remember, it's uh, not that we have to be doing everything, but rather God is the one who actually takes the initiative. God is the one who calls us, as you remember how he called Moses. And it is God who therefore reveals his loving presence to us every time we are at prayer. All that we are asked to do is to be able to commit ourselves to spend that quiet time to pray. So I hope that that has been uh, helpful and uh, fruitful for you during the time that you have been able to spend quiet time in contemplation. I would like to now move on to our second session. And uh, the second session is, uh, the title is Our Christian Response to God's Covenant and the choices that we face. I think this uh, topic uh, is an interesting one because it considers how God enters into friendship with us, how God enters into a promise to be with us and to also guide us with various precepts, commandments and even to enter into a covenant which, as you know, is a higher form of a contract. It is God's promise that He will not break with us, even when we break all our promises. So on this note, I would like to invite you to join me to say a short opening prayer that I quote from Pope Clement the Eleventh. So let us pray. Vouchsafe to conduct me by your wisdom, to restrain me by your justice, to comfort me by your mercy, to defend me by your power. To thee I desire to consecrate all my thoughts, words, actions, and sufferings, that henceforth I may think only of you, speak of you, refer all my actions to your greater glory and suffer willingly whatever you appoint. We make all this rest through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so um, when we look at our Christian response to life, we look at how we're invited to uh, act in one way or another, uh, whether we make good choices or 
bad choices that sometimes we regret and hopefully we can learn from them and to be able to make better choices in future. We understand that fundamentally what we choose is uh, dependent on what we believe in, what we stand for, what we sometimes uh, prescribe to in terms of values, in terms of principles of life. In other words, we are aware that um, who we are today and what we stand for has been influenced by how we've been brought up, how uh, our parents who have instilled certain values in us, whether it is a value of hard work, a value of respect, a value of uh, always um, doing your best. This we call them uh, maybe rules that are in the family. We call this also maybe at times uh, the values that have been passed on from one generation to the next. Um, I don't know about yourself, but I remember my grandmother would always uh, teach me a very simple value of not wasting food. Not even a single grain of rice is to be left in the bowl uneaten. And then um, the uh, motivation for that was very simple. She said, if you leave any grain of rice Next time when you marry, you will not marry a beautiful girl. The girl will have a pork mark in her, on her face. If you leave five grains, there will be five pork marks. So, you know, um, it is, uh, I think, enough for me to uh, be convinced that I should not waste my food. And for that matter, my bowl will never be uh, left with a single grain of rice. Uh. So I unfortunately uh, have not been able to find a beautiful girl to marry and uh, I become a priest instead. But that is a blessing from God. So my dear friends, we, we see that um, all of us uh, do have our values that have been passed on from one generation to the next. And certainly if there, there is a way that can help us understand who we are, and how we make critical choices and decisions in life, it would be fundamentally to see that in every human drama, in every novel that you read, in every movie that you have watched, we can safely conclude that um, they are summarized into three different types of uh, major themes. The theme that are juxtaposed to each other, in terms of life and death over looking at doing good against avoidance of evil. And the third is always about obedience and disobedience. In a way, um, these are the three uh, major themes that are always played out in life, in politics, even at work. Um, so the challenge is for us to understand more fully how we can put into practice some of these basics in terms of making decisions, in terms of how it can guide us to live a happier life. Some people will say, what is happiness? They say, to be happy is to be able to listen and to obey. That could be a very simple way. Um, I remember there was one man who told me why he is so happy. He said, Father, in life, there are only two persons I listen to and I obey. The first is God and the second is my wife. So I do not know whether he put it as uh, my wife first and God second. But nonetheless, he has got at least uh, these two correct. And in a way, if we talk about the uh, how we are to enter into life, we are invited to then maybe have uh, the perspective to pray for the grace that we need. So I would like to suggest for this session that the grace we are asking for or the insight or the understanding would be this, 
that we may ponder and pray for the light to know good from evil and the strength and wisdom to choose life, love and blessings by obeying God's commandments and to receive God's hand of friendship and communion. So this, this would be, um, I think, the grace that you can keep in mind fundamentally, fundamentally to make good choices. And therefore, once we make good choices, we will be able to receive life to its fullness and also uh, be able to fo follow and fulfill the commandments that God has uh, laid out for us. So it is uh, on this note that I would like to ask you to refer to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. I will choose uh, to read from verse 16 onwards. Look, today I am offering you life and prosperity, death and disaster. If you obey the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I am laying down for you today. If you love Yahweh your God and follow His ways, if you keep His commandments, His laws and His customs, you will live and grow numerous. And Yahweh your God will bless you in the country which you are about to enter and make your own. But if your heart turns away, if you refuse to listen, if you let yourself be drawn into worshipping other gods and serving them, I tell you today, you must certainly perish. You will not live for long in the country which you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. Today, I call heaven and earth to witness against you. I'm offering you life or death, blessing or curse. Choose life then so that you and your descendants may live in the love of Yahweh your God, obeying His voice, holding fast to Him, and for in this your life consists. There is a, a lot that is uh, put into this promise by the Lord God Yahweh. We can actually unpack this and even draw a lot of uh, insights and wisdom into what God is fundamentally saying to us. This applies not only to the Hebrew people, in which Moses was already asked to lead into the promised land that they are to enter into, the land of Cana, a land that is supposedly to be flowing with milk and honey. That means a land of abundance, a land of blessing, a land that is full of life and teeming with God's blessings in creation. So we see that this is what the Lord God has invited Moses to lead their people into what we call the promised land. And yet we know that um, it wasn't so easy. Moses had a tough time trying to lead the stubborn people out of slavery already into the desert. And yet during that time, they were a people who regressed in their behavior. They were grumbling, they were murmuring, they were complaining, sometimes not unlike Singaporeans. And so we see that Moses had to deal with all these grumblings and uh, discontent and even dissent from the people. And yet the Lord God kept on encouraging Moses not to give up on them. And even Moses had to intervene not to allow the hand of wrath to strike punishment on the people. So, right to the end, the choice that the people have been asked to make is simply this. Choose life 
and not death, that you may have blessings and have life, and that you have this, your descendants numerous beyond your ability to count and compare. So there is something wonderful about uh, human beings. This seems to be a very important point to say, choose life. And yet, we experience very often that the forces of death are always at work. We can say that, um, you know, there are people who, whom you think should have the common sense to choose life. But yet, on the other hand, they may have uh, sometimes no qualms to choose death, either willfully or either because of circumstances, you know. Example could be abortion of the unborn baby. Then sometimes there are people who, you know, because of the suffering they experience and the pain they have, they sometimes they say, I'd rather die. And then of course there are situations where relationships, uh, where relationships when they go bad and go sour, um, and they feel that uh, maybe life is not worth living, and then because uh, the girlfriend is jilted, and then, you know, after that, somebody takes their own life. So we see very often how life is so vulnerable. Uh, of course, these days, we are even more painfully reminded that even a small virus can be a threat to our lives. Um, so sometimes we have to ask ourselves, if choosing life is so important, we have to make sure that we consider how to choose wisely. St. Ignatius, as you know, uh, tells us about how we are to engage in making right choices in terms of discernment. Discernment is trying to recognize where is a good spirit at work in my life as opposed to the bad spirit. And the basic understanding is when I make good choices, it leads me on a trajectory to love God, to follow God, and to do God's will more fully and also more uh, lovingly each time. So that is the direction when I choose life when I choose to follow God's commandments. And the exact opposite would be true, where the bad spirit will disturb me and will instill fear in me, will at times distort my judgment, and even at times attempt to make me fall into despair, into uh, darkness, and into destruction and death. So this is the uh, trajectory of the bad spirit. So in a general way, we can already tell if I make choices and decisions, where does it lead me on the path? Is it a path of life or is it a path of death? So this seems to be a fundamental way that we can already recognize the importance of uh, choosing decisions that are blessed by God and as opposed to those that becomes a curse. We also know that uh, we're invited to ponder, to take the commandments of God to heart. To ponder in our heart is to take time to consider, take time to pray, to even at times contemplate and even at times to seriously um, even uh, have that uh, ability to in the silence and solitude of prayer to discover where is the voice of God calling me. And when we respond to the voice of God, we will know that God will always lead us into life. And the voice of God is always a voice of encouragement, a voice that is loving, a voice that is encouraging, a voice that will not condemn me for all my sinfulness, in all my human frailty, in all the mistakes that I make in life. I know that I will hear the voice 
to say, I have forgiven you. Do not despair. So that is um, one way that I can discern how to listen to the voice of God leading me into life. Then, of course, I, I think you know that the exact opposite is true. Very often we can hear what we call negative voices, you know, voices where they condemn us, they undermine our self-esteem, uh, our self-respect, uh, and even our self-confidence. The voices that will say, oh, you are so stupid, you know, oh, you are such a failure, oh, I don't think you deserve to live, you know, yeah. oh, I don't think your father will forgive you for making this mistake or for taking uh, this decision against his will. And so, you know, sometimes uh, we have to be able to discern and to recognize where is a good spirit leading me and where is a bad spirit distracting me and leading me astray. You know, um, one of the most important things that I have discovered in my own life is the fact that when I choose life, it means I choose to do anything that will promote life, that will encourage people to live life in a way that will be due their due and their dignity. So one of the things that I always uh, like to do is to always encourage young people, especially children, you know, pay them a compliment. Oh, you have a beautiful shirt today. Oh, you have a Superman uh, you know, shirt here on you. Uh, you know, so yeah, you look so good in it, you know. And then sometimes, you know, they may have had a bad day. And then because I uh, say something nice to them, yeah, that might be a simple way to lift their burdens. Maybe they are so stressed from uh, their schoolwork. Or maybe they have just been scolded by their parents. So you never know how a simple, kind word of encouragement can make such a difference so that they will not be depressed. Um, I think some of you are aware of uh, some, you know, uh, potential harm that can be done in the modern media of uh, internet uh, bullying, for example. You heard about the case of uh, a boy from Australia who was bullied by his friends uh, because of his uh, condition, uh, his health condition, the suffering from something of a dwarfism. And then because he was bullied and he wanted to end his own life, you know, and so we see that that would be the bad spirit at work. So the bad spirit can bully us, can taunt us, can tease us. But you know what? A bad spirit can never take away our will to live. And thankfully, um, this boy uh, received uh, so much support and encouragement from all over the world that uh, I think that has really helped him turn his life around. And he even uh, raised a lot of money to donate to uh, children's uh, welfare and maybe it's associations that promote the well-being of children or those who suffer from dwarfism. So it's amazing that uh, he has now been able to turn his uh, situation of despair around into a situation of hope in the situation where he can be a source of life and encouragement to others. So we see that there is also another uh, set of uh, values at work. And the second set that I like to share with you is about the choice that we make to be loving rather than to hate. You know, it's not always easy to be loving, especially to people whom we find difficult to get along. Maybe we have difficult colleagues who are at work. Uh, maybe you have people who make life difficult and do not share with you certain information. And maybe you have uh, colleagues who are at your workplace who can't stand the sight of you. And maybe vice versa, you can't stand the sight of them. But for us as Christians, we need to know that we have to always remember that we enter into the friendship 
with Christ. And therefore, we imitate whatever Christ tells us. And remember, our Lord said very clearly, I do not call you servants any longer because his, the servant does not know what his master is doing. I call you friends because I have revealed everything that I have known to you from my Father. So this is uh, the text from John uh, chapter 15 onwards. And so this is part of the way we need to be reminded that if we enter into the friendship with Christ, we are then to imitate His vision, His vision of life to be loving, to be forgiving, to be encouraging, to be happy and let happiness be a source of joy for people who are finding it difficult in life. So this is, I think, fundamentally our own approach to making choices. That in every situation, you ask yourself, is this the most loving thing to do in any decision that you make? And therefore, if you know that it's a loving decision, it would also be reasonable. Um, we sometimes uh, have uh, the ability to use our intelligence and intellect to know how to discern and how to sift our choices. And our choices must always lead to the human flourishing as uh, one Jesuit would use in teaching us philosophy, must lead to the human flourishing of the other. Does it help that person to become a better person? Does my loving attitude and action help that person to have strength in carrying out his mission to carry out his work. And I think I want to share with you um, how important it is for us to enter into the friendship with Christ by imitating his virtues and his values, especially to be loving. St. Irenaeus tells us this, that friendship with God brings us immortality in life to those who accept it. So this is a wonderful uh, insight of St. Irenaeus. And of course, some of you will know his other saying, the person who is fully alive. He is the one who is able to really find God's blessing. The glory of God is the person who is fully alive, as you know. So we enter into the friendship with Christ and that brings us Immortality means brings us into the life of Christ at work in us. Brings us into a share of His promises that He will be with us till the end of time. And most of all, that He will give us a share of eternal life. This is something which we all know that no amount of money can buy. No amount of money can make us give eternal life to anyone. Only God can give us this unconditional gift. Recently, I have been trying to also reach out to people who have been um, deprived of the Holy Eucharist. And recently, um, there was uh, one parishioner who was not very well and has been suffering from some minor stroke. And I offered to go and say Mass for her and some small group of friends in her house. And then at the end of Mass, she said this to me, Father, thank you so much for bringing the Eucharist to me. This is one thing which money cannot buy. So I was so struck by what she said. And she uh, truly missed receiving the Holy Eucharist. So indeed, my dear friends, um, this is an important reflection for us to make always the loving choice in our lives. So we go on to uh, another part of uh, how we look at um, the ability to make good choices is to be able to be obedient as opposed to be disobedient. You know, obedience is not something that comes naturally to us. 
when we're young, we always uh, are told by our parents to obey, you know. They tell something, uh, make sure that we obey. If we don't obey, sometimes we get in trouble, you know. We uh, may fall sick because we eat something we're not supposed to eat, or we may break a plate because we have not been obedient to tell uh, the, to listen to our parents, uh, not to play with uh, the plates when they were eating or something like that, you know. So obedience uh, is a way of uh, recognizing what it means. It means to listen. It means to ponder. And it means to also later be able to come to a decision to always follow where the voice of God is listening, is speaking to us so that we may be able to listen to the commandments of the Lord. And I think this is precisely also the way in which um, Our Lady was able to listen to what God was saying to her through the voice of the Archangel Gabriel. You know, so when she was at the Annunciation invited to uh, bring Jesus into the world, she was deeply disturbed by the words of uh, the Archangel Gabriel. And yet she somehow, uh, after a lot of prayer, a lot of pondering, she said, let your will be done and not mine. So I think when we uh, are able to obey, when we are able to listen to God's uh, voice speaking to us, we are naturally invited to always know that um, God makes us obey the commandments, His precepts, His covenant, so that we may have life. As in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the law that was given to His people and the commandments, the Ten Commandments. We, if we obey the commandments, we will have life. We will experience peace, joy and happiness. It seems so simple and yet that is what it takes. You know, um, I have uh, some parishioners who sometimes uh, they share with me some very uh, fundamental principles of life. And, and one of them, uh, he has, uh, I think, about 12 or 13 children. So I was uh, really quite pleasantly surprised that in this day and age, you can have such a big family. So one day I approached him and said, uh, yeah, Mr. You know, let's say kind John, how is it that you are able to manage so many children? And then he said, Father, it's very simple. I'm a God-fearing man and I follow all the commandments of the Lord. So I say, well, that's good. So I think for any, uh, anyone who wants to have a big family, uh, following the commandments seems to be a basic criteria. And then the other thing that I know for us you know, religious, we take the vows of poverty, of uh, chastity, and of obedience. So it's like uh, incorporated into our DNA, so to say. But it's always not so easy. I tell you that uh, some of you will know about this uh, incident of the sinking of the Titanic. But more interestingly is that there's another story to this. Was, uh, there was a Jesuit Father Brown who in the early days, in the 1930s uh, you know, or 1913 onwards, you know, he, he was a very keen phot photographer. And in those days, as you know, they were using very simple ones with uh, the plates and so on. So apparently, he had a chance to sail in the Titanic. Uh, he was actually traveling from Liverpool to uh, Cork, and that was the stopping point. And um, when he was traveling there, he met some very uh, wealthy Americans and one wealthy uh, couple offered to pay for his passage from Cork to cross the Atlantic to America. And then, of course, he was quite thrilled at the prospect that he might be able to uh, have that uh, trip you know, paid for. But being a good Jesuit, he had to ask permission. And so he sent a telegram to his uh, superior, the provincial of Ireland at that time, and uh, asking for permission to accept this uh, free offer and to continue his journey. The telegram came back to him almost immediately, and the words were all very short, brief, and sharp. 
get off that ship at once. And Father Brown, being a good Jesuit, had to obey. And of course, he got off the ship. And then, uh, as you know, we say the rest is history. And apparently he took a lot of photos when he was inside, you know, the interior, uh, the exterior, and so many, you know, the pictures of people around. And in fact, some of the photos, from what I understand, were used uh, for making the movie, The Titanic. But one thing that we can learn from this is simple, that obedience can save your life, as it did Father Brown's life. Huh? So you see, we never know when... Um, we are told to obey. Sometimes you may not understand the consequences. You may not see the future. You may not even see the next step ahead of you. But remember, there's always wisdom in obedience. So we come to uh, look at also the experience of how uh, Ignatius himself um, was at that time also trying to establish the Jesuit as a religious order. And uh, he himself had to, to obey, to discern where uh, is God leading him. He wasn't sure whether this was God's will and whether things will work out well. But when he and his companions were on the way to Rome to meet the Holy Father to ask for permission to set up uh, the new religious order, uh, that time was about 1538 uh, or so, or 39. Um, he stopped by uh, at a small chapel called La Stota. And in that chapel, he prayed. And he sensed interiorly what God was speaking to him and saying to him. And he received these words that we know to be uh, his own mystical experience of God giving encouragement and strength. And the words are, I shall be favorable to you in Rome and I will place you with my son. And so this has become, uh, you know, one of the very key experiences of uh, St. Ignatius in having the confidence to know that this is a divine enterprise for him to be able to established the Jesuits as a religious order, which eventually was approved in 1540. So there are many um, experiences and examples that we can draw on in terms of looking at how we pray to listen to God's uh, voice, how we obey His commandments and precepts and teachings in the church that will always be a source of blessing to us. So I hope that this will be uh, helpful for you. And um, one more example uh, before I go on is uh, to find the insight that we can gain from also uh, St. Teresa of Avila, who uh, speaks about what it means to obey. So she says this, Note very carefully, daughters, that the silk worm has of necessity to die. And it is this which will cost you most. For death comes more easily when one can see oneself living in a new life. Whereas our duty now is to continue living this present life and yet to die of our own free will. I confess to you that we shall find this much harder, but it is of the greatest value and reward will be greater too if you gain the victory. But you must not doubt the possibility of this true union with the will of God. So there is, uh, I think, a very profound insight given by St. Teresa of Avila, which is to, as I mentioned in my talk earlier, about the need to die to what might be obstacles in our way of fulfilling God's will, of our change of our metamorphosis, of our transformation. So in other words, uh, part of our Christian living in following God's will is always a uh, dying to oneself, a uh, dying to one's pride, a uh, dying to one's ego, 
and sometimes even a dying to one's will and ambition. That is always difficult, that is always hard to do. Uh, but the surprising thing is when we are able to take that step, change and transformation can easily come in and help us to be able to trust that we are doing God's will. So on that note, uh, I would like to take you um, now to looking at how we can enter into our time for prayer. I would like to invite you to reflect on how God has been helping you in your daily lives, how perhaps the three questions that I like you to uh, consider. The first is, uh, what are the criteria that you use to make decisions in your life? And the second uh, is, when was the last time you have blessed someone? And how did you feel after that? And to bless, uh, as you know, is the opposite of cursing. Uh, if you have been cursing someone, maybe it's, a bit, uh, it's, a, it's about time that we stop to curse, but rather to bless. You know, sometimes to be frank with you, when I meet a difficult person, I'm tempted to say some bad things under my breath. But I'm reminded to maybe to pray for that person instead, to ask God to bless that person. Maybe that person has had a difficult time, a difficult life. Uh, so I think I should not be in a position to curse them, but rather to try to bless them. And the third question that you can take for your prayer is this, that looking back, is there one choice that you have made which you feel you could have done better or you could have changed? So these are the three questions that I like to uh, ask you for uh, time to pray and to reflect. And also I'd like to give you two texts that you can use for your prayer. The one is uh, what I have already quoted, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 to 12. It's about the two ways of blessings or curse. And the second text uh, will be John chapter 15, which is actually uh, under the header of uh, the, the vine and uh, about Jesus wanting us to be fruitful, wanting us to be his friends, to enter into the friendship of Christ that will truly bring us immortality. So my dear friends, I hope that uh, you have been able to uh, gain some uh, insights into this. And as a way to uh, conclude this, uh, I came across a, a situation where, you know, the Irish have always got a great sense of humour. So there was this man uh, who was enjoying his meal and talking very heartily a big chicken all by himself. So he was enjoying his uh, lunch and then as uh, he was uh, eating, uh, a lady came in walking by with her pet dog. And of course, the pet dog uh, was staring at the man and then started to uh, salivate and then even stopping by with the paws sticking out like that, waiting eagerly to even hopefully get a piece of uh, his uh, delicious lunch. And then of course the man looked at the dog and looked at the, uh, the owner. So he uh, said to the lady, Ma'am, may I throw the dog a bit? Then the madam was a bit uh, hesitant and uh, she looked at him and said, Sure, of course you may. And then the man put his lunch aside, got up, picked up the dog and threw the dog a bit further down the road. So sometimes uh, it's uh, one thing to try to befriend uh, others but you may also be given the wrong actions. Um, my dear friends, I pray that you will be able to enter into this time of retreat to know that uh, when we are hungry, when we are thirsty, the Lord God will never throw us off, but He will always be there to nourish us and to strengthen our faith. So have a good time for your prayer. 
I suggest you spend about half an hour or so for your quiet time to be with the Lord. God bless you all. A blessed day to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'd like to invite you all to stand and sing praises to our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, Savior of the world, thank you for your love, and most especially for your presence right now. Lord, Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds. Bless our souls, O Lord. Feed our minds with your wisdom. Claim our hearts, Lord. Bless our eyes to see you, O Lord, that we may see the boundless of thy grace and mercy. Open my eyes, Lord. Lord Jesus, for lavishing us with your grace, love, and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your guidance and protection. Lord God, accept these humble offerings, our weak flesh, and our sinful hearts. Lord Jesus, continue to offer us your blessing of forgiveness and thy blessings of grace so that whenever we go, Lord Jesus, whenever we open our mouth, your people may hear praises of your name to give them comfort and assurance of your love and mercy. Live in me, O oh Lord. Now in 
Praise to you. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, thank you for the richness of your love and mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for blessing us with this online retreat. Father God, you are the creator of all good things, the source of our lives. You are the Father of God, and we are the King. With the presence of the Holy Spirit, who keeps on giving us thy grace, mold us with your love. Form and inform us with your words through your servant, Father Colin, so that we will become that person that you want us to be and do your most holy will. Lead us. So uh, welcome back to our last session for the retreat. I trust that you have been able to spend some quiet time to pray and to reflect. And I think most of all, to be able to recognize that uh, prayer is uh, really a gift from God. Prayer is really helping us to be in touch with ourselves, with our feelings, with our thoughts and emotions, with our attitudes, with our challenges and pain in life. And so sometimes it is... Uh, not surprising to hear that many people, when they spend time to pray, they are able to be in touch with the hand of God, helping them to overcome uh, great difficulties in life, and at times also to help them overcome uh, pain and to experience healing. Uh, sometimes when I'm uh, counseling people who come to see me, when they have a very difficult problem that uh, is almost impossible to solve, I will always tell them to go and pray and spend quiet time with the Lord in the adoration room. And uh, very often, um, it is the Lord who will give them an answer. It is the Lord who will perhaps be there to console them. And it is the Lord who certainly will be there to listen to them in their pain and in their grief. So if there's anything today that is important, is now coming to the last session. Uh, the theme is to transform the world by the choices that we make to change ourselves. And you know, uh, very often, we always uh, grow up with certain dream, you know. Oh, I, when I grow up, I want to be great and I want to change the world, you know. Because the world is in such a bad shape, the world is in uh, such a divided world. Uh, so sometimes we all have dreams and ideals. Uh, and yet, uh, the biggest challenge is not trying to change the world, but to change ourselves. And of course, uh, one way to change ourselves is to maybe learn to make good choices in life. Uh, we always say um, that uh, if you want to be happy, make sure that you choose the right person to marry. 
If you choose the right person to get married, you will be a happy man. If you choose a wrong partner, Socrates will say, you will then become a philosopher like himself. So it's wonderful to know uh, even philosophers have a sense of wisdom and sense of uh, humor to live with their choices. Um, so today I invite you then to join me uh, for this uh, short opening prayer uh, from none other than Mother Teresa of Calcutta herself. So please uh, join me for this prayer. And it's on kindness. Be kind and merciful. Let no one ever come to you without coming away better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness. Kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, kindness in your smile, kindness in your warm greeting. In the slums, we are the light of God's kindness to the poor to children, to the poor, to all who suffer and are lonely. Give always a happy smile. Give them not only your care, but also your heart. We make all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, if you even take this prayer to heart, to ponder on it, uh, we will be able to gain uh, a lot of insights on how we can transform the world. If the world is such a sad place, how can it make the world happier? Well, I think if you are happier, the world will be happier. You know, they say, if you smile, the world will smile with you. If you cry, the world will cry with you, you know. So there is something of the uh, inner disposition of a person, uh, the inner intentions of a person, and of course the inner thoughts and emotions and memories of a person that can uh, give us the ability to change perception. And sometimes uh, the way we say to change the world is not that the world physically may have changed, but that the perception in itself changes. That is, I think, a critical uh, difference. And very often, as you may also know, in various uh, fields of therapy, counselling, they um, always try to help uh, the counsellor to see how to help the counsellee overcome uh, any um, views and mindset and perspective that may be the source of the problem. So. Uh, the way to, as it were, uh, attempt to give a solution is to make sure that they are able to have some shift in understanding, some uh, knowledge gained, uh, some insights given. And that in itself, as it were, uh, can actually help uh, the counsellor uh, be able to come to a resolution and be therefore able to resolve their difficulties that they may be presenting. So in, in many ways, uh, we are invited to say, what does it mean for us also to grow to become happier, maybe to be perfect as we already know, is to be more loving as advised by St. Teresa of Avila. But uh, there's another view which is given by uh, also uh, Blessed Cardinal uh, John Henry Newman, and he says this, In the higher world, it is otherwise. But here below, to live is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often. It's a very uh, well-known uh, saying of uh, Henry Newman. And yet there is some wisdom in it that we can also reflect on. Uh, if you want to be perfect, it's to change. Because most of us will find it difficult to change. Um, there's always what we call resistances to change. At your work, if you have a new idea you want to implement it, I can tell you, you can be sure you're going to get resistance to changing 
uh, anything. Can be changing your uh, favorite uh, coffee maker from one brand to another. I can tell you people will go to war with that, you know. Uh, it can be changing your photostatic machine from one brand to another. It can be changing your work schedule. Um, so it's amazing that human beings are so complacent. We are so used to habitually doing the same thing, eating the same food, taking the same bus, you know, uh, wearing the same pair of shoes, whatever it might be. Uh, yeah. Uh, and yet, the invitation for us is to have the courage to change, have the, uh, maybe the openness to change often. On that note, I would like to share with you uh, a wonderful story uh, taken from uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. So it's uh, on this story, and it goes like this. So uh, this is uh, Alice speaking to the caterpillar. <clears throat> Who are you? said the caterpillar. This is not an encouraging opening for a conversation, Alice replied. Rather shyly, she, re she answered, I, 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 I hardly know, sir. Just at present, at least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have changed several times since then, the caterpillar then turned to her and said, What do you mean by that? Explain yourself. Uh, I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself. You see? The caterpillar sternly said, I don't see. I'm afraid. I cannot put it more plainly and clearly, Alice replied very politely. I can't understand myself as from the beginning and it is being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. It isn't, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps you haven't found it yet, said Alice. But when you have to turn into a chrysalis, you'll know someday, you know. And then, after that, turning into a butterfly, I should think that I will feel a little queer, won't you? Not a bit, said the caterpillar. And then Alice uh, kind of turned around and felt very sad that the caterpillar could not see what she was trying to convey to her. So, you know, this uh, is a wonderful uh, example of how uh, changes uh, take place um, almost every minute, almost every second, uh, sometimes imperceptible to us. And as you know, Alice was trying to explain the various stages of uh, changes until she doesn't even know how to give the answer of her identity. Who are you? If you're referring to the moment you, before you change, or the moment after you change, or the moment where you are. So it was uh, quite difficult for her to give uh, a straight answer to the caterpillar using uh, that simple question, who are you? Um, so I think this is also part of the way that uh, we continue to see um, various aspects of our lives. And so there are three points that I like to propose to you for you to take to your prayer. The first one is being able to see the world as God sees us. The second is about the self-image uh, about create, being created in God's image and likeness. And the third point is uh, for us to have the courage to change. Seeing the world is, uh, as I already mentioned to you, um, is to know how we are able to understand ourselves. Children 
see the world from their perspective. How often it is that when we see something when we were a child that seems so big, and then later when you grow up and you look at the same object again, it can be a, you know, a, a tree, it can be a, a building, then you realize that hey, it's not so big as you had thought it was before. Um, in the same way, uh, how we see the world is a way to understand ourselves, uh, understand our perception, and also to understand sometimes the distortion that comes in. Fundamentally, if we want to change ourselves, maybe a good starting point is to then enter into the world in which how God sees us. And I would like to share with you uh, the quotation by Master Eckhart. Um, this quotation, interestingly, um, was uh, said to me years back in the 1980s. You know, imagine that uh, more than 30 years ago by a brother, Brother Gasper, a redemptorist. And I happened to be um, walking around the old seminary then, the old major seminary, which is present day the Catholic Center. And I remember I was just walking by and Brother Gasper just um, appeared to me and he quoted this, the eye with which I see God is the same eye with which God sees me. My eye and God's eye are one eye, one seeing, one knowing, and one loving. Of course, when he said that to me, I was clueless about what he was trying to convey to me. And how that all came together is only when I had a chance to look at the logo of the Year of Mercy which, as you know, uh, was proclaimed by Pope Francis, I think, about 2015. And so, if you look at the logo, it is amazing how uh, the Father be merciful as the I am merciful, you know. The Father is merciful. So, you have the picture of, perhaps some of you might interpret this differently, uh, perhaps like Jesus carrying the lamb, you know. It can be the father and the prodigal son. Uh, and of course, you can see different interpretation. But interestingly, if you look at the, the painting of the eyes, you have two persons there. So strictly speaking, you should have uh, four sets of eyes. But if you look carefully, there are only three sets of eyes. The eye of the son and eye of the father almost merge into one so that the two eye becomes one eye. So that's why when I um, saw this picture and connect it to the quotation, it kind of all made sense and how everything fell in place. So it's amazing that if we are to see our eyes with the eyes of God, then that is how God sees the world. That is how God sees me. Isn't it amazing? And I think if there is uh, an insight to be gained here is that you ask yourself, how does God see me? How does Jesus see us? And you know, um, the eyes of Jesus is so amazing that he always has that kind of glaze, that kind of uh, uh, look about him that will gaze at us, that will ponder lovingly at each and every one of us. You remember the text where how he say he gazed at the rich young man because he could not fulfill uh, everything to sell everything and come and follow me because he was a rich man and Jesus loved him. So it's the loving eyes of Jesus, it's the loving eyes of God that must be also the eyes in which I now look at the world, look at every human being, look at creation. I think this is the way to help us uh, change and transform ourselves. And finally, what is important in this uh, quotation is for us to know that this is the eye of God that is always filled with compassion for us sinners. You know, um, 
And when you are filled with love and compassion, you will never want to condemn somebody. You will always be giving that person a second chance. You will always be there to say, oh, never mind, never mind, you know. Uh, this person uh, deserves to be given a third chance. Oh, uh, excuse this person, you know, I think he didn't know what he was saying. Uh, sorry, he was very rude to you. Uh. My son was very rude to you, you know. He didn't mean to say that, you know. So we always um, put ourselves in the position to excuse the faults of people. That is the meaning of compassion. A compassionate heart where you know how weak we are and how weak other people are. And as a result, we are always there to try to rescue them. We are trying to excuse them. And we are trying to even help them uh, be protected from harm. And so this is uh, the fundamental approach of how if we are able to see with the eyes of God, then it doesn't take us very far to know that this is how we can change ourselves and how we can change the world by our perception. The second uh, point that i like to take you through is uh, again looking at ourselves, our self-image created in God's image and likeness. You know, um, we study uh, psychology and uh, child developmental uh, you know, studies from various uh, people like Piaget, Erickson, um, and they always talk about the importance of uh, cultivating uh, positive self-image and self-esteem. And where do children gain their self-esteem? When they are able to have a positive reinforcement. Sometimes we say positive strokes, meaning to say that they are always uh, affirmed, they are given approval, they are given acceptance. Uh, these three A, approval, acceptance. Uh, and So we, we know that this is how, if we are able to do more of that, then it builds up the self-esteem of a person. When a person is knocked about too much in life, and where they are really um, kind of given negative feedback, they are told they are stupid, they are no good, um, you know, uh, they are crazy, uh, they are failure, then it is no wonder that, you know, many people who are in prison, people who run foul of the law, they are the people who actually have had a bad deal done to them uh, from the very beginning, that they had a, a bad card, a set of cards given to them, you know. So we, we need to address this uh, very fundamental aspect of uh, seeing ourselves, our self-image. And then when we are able to receive positive affirmation, like we are able to receive uh, affirmation and approval, then that gives us, I think, uh, a long way to help us becoming better persons, and how we can uh, also change others. When we see the world to be good, then we know how to be good ourselves. And of course, if we also see that God sees us as good, then it is almost inevitable that the world that we created is also for our good. And in fact, if you look at the the Genesis text of creation. We always see how at the end of each day of creation, whether God created the light at the end of the first day. And the, the refrain is, God saw that it was good. So we know that if this is how creation is created good, and therefore every human person is created good, we need to then go back to this original blessing of God, the original goodness that we are meant to share. And once we can reclaim this, then we know where the distortion can come in. Distortion can come in for people who themselves have never experienced goodness, never experienced kindness in their lives. So if they have experienced bitterness, cruelty, injustice uh, when they are growing up uh, as a child, then they are the ones who are wounded and they will in turn 
victimize others, they will in turn be wounding others. So I think we all need to almost like go back uh, to our own self-image that has been formed in our formative years. And when we can go back and say, where might be the points of woundedness, the points of distortion, and then we can go back to experience healing and to recover our good self-image that is made in the image and likeness of God, then we can make a positive contribution and we can then change the world. Just as an as example for myself, um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, my father was a rather hot-tempered person and uh, quite impatient. And uh, we uh, would always be very fearful of him. Uh, whenever he comes back from work, we would always run away because uh, we're bound to get a scolding from him, you know, for whatever reasons. Um, sometimes uh, the fear uh, is so great that uh, we would not dare to even speak to him at all. So this has become almost like the, um, uh, the norm for me. And especially I remember uh, when we were having our meals, our meals are always in silence because he, he will be reprimanding us in Teochew. Ai jia, mai jia, mai ta we. Means if you eat or don't eat, don't say anything. Don't, don't talk, you know. Yeah. So I remember later I joined the Jesuits and I, we had uh, to have meals in common. And at the meals, everybody was talking and I felt really uncomfortable at that time. And it was my first exposure to religious life. It took me a long time to get out of this, you know, shell and out of this, uh, you know, uh, rule of not talking at meals. Uh, so I had to reclaim that in order to recover my self-image. So the second thing that maybe we need to uh, understand in the uh, self-image is uh, St. Ignatius talks about it in the spiritual exercises in terms of goodness and the good spirit. So he says this, The good spirit strengthens and encourages, consoles and inspires, establishes a peace and sometimes moves to a firm resolve. To lead a good life gives delight and joy and no obstacle seems to be so formidable that it cannot be faced and overcome with God's grace. The good spirit, therefore, continues an upright person's progress in responding to God's continual invitation to doing good. I think the uh, wisdom given by St. Ignatius is really to know that um, we, when we experience the good spirit, the good spirit really brings out the best in us the good spirit will continue to be a source of inspiration and will always give us what is necessary for us to overcome our own uh, human failures and faults and weaknesses. And then when we have that kind of uh, encouragement, when we are able to experience in that loving setting God's goodness, then we have the the ability to change, we have the ability to overcome uh, all our uh, problems and obstacles that we face in life. So in other words, the good spirit will always be there to strengthen us when we need the, whole, the, the good spirit most of all. I think this is fundamental for us in our own spiritual life. And that's why I told you that um, it is always important to uh, be a source of blessing to people around us, to always give words of kindness and encouragement to children. And uh, that will go a long way to building a positive and good self-image of themselves. And finally, the third point that I'd like to take uh, for you to uh, put into practice um, is the courage to change. We know that change is often difficult and also even painful. And yet, uh, we know that uh, we cannot remain the same all the time. We have to have the capacity to effect change in our lives. 
we have to also know that uh, we are able to change because of the holding environment where we know that uh, people who are around us uh, are loving to us, who will are good when they reprimand us or when they discipline us. So we always respond to people who have good intentions and not bad intentions. So it's like if it's your mother who loves you and who tells you something uh, and uh, to change or to point out your fault, um, in all humility, you know that you will listen to your mother because she does so with loving intention and she does so out of uh, your own uh, concern, you know, for your own good. So that is how maybe you, you know that you respond more positively uh, to someone who uh, wants you to change. But it's the exact opposite if it's someone who uh, is not loving, someone who is fearful, someone who has evil intention, surely you will be more resistant to that person uh, asking you to change. And so we have uh, St. Teresa of Avila, uh, of course, using that quotation that I have uh, also used, that perfection does not consist of consolation, but of an increase in love. And so this is where we need to know um, that in our own lives, uh, we are invited to continue to change constantly. And the ability to change is to grow in humility, to grow in sincerity, and also to grow in perfection by being more loving. The more a person is loving, the more that person is open to change, open to correction, and open to perfection. You know, um, there is uh, one of my um, parishioners uh, who is probably one of the few that I have known to become, uh, you know, uh, an Olympian who represented Singapore in hockey uh, in Melbourne in, I think, 1965. It's none other than Mr. Uh, Rudy, uh, Rudy Mossburgen. And some of you may know him. And at, at his... Uh, funeral wake and his uh, funeral mass, uh, I was privileged to say, um, his uh, granddaughter cited a motto for him that he lived by all his life. And it is this that uh, has really inspired me also. Uh, he says this, that what is impossible I do at once and miracles take a little longer. Um, what has really struck me is uh, the fact that he's got this ability to respond, the ability to change, so that he's able to always respond to something that is difficult, something that is imp impossible, he attends to at once. And of course, we do believe in miracles, and miracles, you need to be patient, you need to uh, have time, you need to have faith to believe that God will work a miracle eventually. So I think his life has always been, I think, uh, a life lived in service of God. Uh, he was always uh, volunteering to play the piano, play the organ at the cathedral in our church, everywhere. A very um, simple, uh, but also very um, influential man uh, who lived by that motto, of how to trust in God, how to have the courage to change, and how to face life when it's difficult, when it's even impossible. So we uh, recognize that uh, there are also many things that we can uh, do in our lives. And you know, during these days of crisis too, um, I remember that uh, we've been trying to encourage change in terms of how we manage our donations in the church. You know, one of our difficulties has been to be uh, counting money. And uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, uh, human errors are bound to creep in. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, a $5 note it will be uh, mistaken to be a $10 note or whatever, the coins, you know. So there were those so many problems uh, with our attempts to make sure that we uh, have the correct tally for money we collect and how we, we're going to bank them in. 
So this was a big problem and I was uh, thinking why don't we uh, learn from other churches as well and go maybe gyro. Uh, so get our Catholics to donate by gyro or even maybe use some other e-banking facilities. You know, I, I have been uh, uh, at this since I came in as a parish priest of St. Ignatius more than two years ago. And you know what? Whatever that I did, nothing worked. Uh, they kept on resisting. Oh, it's not easy to introduce this change, Father. Uh, some priests don't know what they're doing. Uh, oh, we are afraid there'll be fraud, uh, people will be cheating you. And so I have all sorts of excuses given to me. But guess what? It takes a small virus to effect a crisis and a change. Recently, as you know, you know, now that we have no masses, the next question is, but Father, we need to also maintain the church and everything. And no masses means no Sunday collection. So thankfully, uh, the uh, authorities concerned have agreed to allow the use of pay now and pay la to support uh, all the Catholic churches in the Sunday collection. So, you know, there is always, uh, we say, a, a blessing even in bleak times. Uh, uh, there's always a silver lining uh, in the dark clouds. And I think this is one, maybe one aspect of uh, the COVID-19 that I can say uh, I'm a bit grateful to this. <laughs> Strange enough, isn't it? Yeah. But it's amazing how uh, you know, humanly, we are so resistant to change. And then in moments like this, well, snap a finger and things are able to move. So my dear friends, we uh, come to uh, the uh, end of our retreat. And I'd like to uh, take you through um, some of the texts that you may use for um, the prayer. And uh, I invite you to take uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 22, where Jesus is led by the Spirit uh, and how he was filled with wisdom. And the second one is uh, to know that God's grace is always sufficient for us in our challenges and difficulties in life. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 to 10. Um, some of the questions that you can take for your reflection would be this. Number one, what do I find most difficult to change in me? And what grace do I need from God to help me change? The second question, what fears am I aware of in myself that prevent me from being loving to others because I want to be accepted without being judged? And the third question that you can take with you is, uh, what sins do I need to overcome to be free and joyful as a follower of Christ? Um, we certainly would pray for different graces and another grace that maybe you can pray for would be in the words of Raiho uh, Nebu, uh, writer and theologian. And he says this, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. It is true that sometimes there are certain things that we will find difficult to change, but there are some things that I can still change, but I need the courage to do so. So most importantly of all, I would say is that let us be in all humility, know that we are not perfect, that we are weak, and that we always need the grace of God to help us to make changes. We do what we can, and we allow God's Spirit to push us a little bit. Sometimes maybe God can also push us uh, through, as it were, um, things that can harm us, like the virus, you know. Then we make all the changes that we never imagined is possible. And on that note, if I may say, if there's anything that we should also remember is not to take ourselves too seriously, but always knowing that, um, you know, our own lives uh, is in fact a blessing from God and our own lives would be a gift from God in which God rejoices, in which God uh, delights in us and that therefore we should never take ourselves too seriously but learn to love 
and to have a sense of humour. It is on this note that uh, I would like to share with you uh, as a concluding um, prayer for this whole session. It's a prayer that uh, Pope Francis himself uh, shares and himself uh, has actually uh, confided uh, to many people and, and to also those people whom he had a chance to share. If you have watched um, the uh, movie, uh, Pope Francis, the man of his words, is quoted in that movie as well. But I was so surprised because uh, this is something of a prayer which he has been using for the past 40 years. He said he will say this prayer after his morning prayer. I will just quote you the first line, and it goes something like this. He say, Grant me, Lord, good digestion, and Lord, something to digest. I thought that is a, a very humorous way to uh, say that prayer, which is uh, attributed to uh, St. Thomas More. The rest of the words, uh, I think it would be quite beautiful to just go through the rest of them as well, and we conclude uh, this session with this prayer. So do join me for this prayer. Grant me, O Lord, good digestion and also something to digest. Grant me a healthy body and the necessary good humour to maintain it. Grant me a simple soul that knows to treasure all that is good and that doesn't frighten easily at the sight of evil, but rather finds the means to put things back in their place. Give me a soul that knows not boredom, grumblings, sighs and laments, nor excess of stress because of that obstructing thing called I. Grant me, Lord, a sense of good humour. Allow me the grace to be able to take a joke, to discover in life a bit of joy and to be able to share it with others. We make all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. May my God bless the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you and uh, have a, a wonderful time of prayer and silence and reflection with the Lord. Until we see you again, God bless you. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we hope you have found this online retreat valuable. We thank you for your participation and support and look forward to doing more such online talks or retreats in the future. CBN is a self-funded non-profit organization and we need your support to continue to bring more programs and events to you. The following are the options for you to make love offerings in order to help CBN defray some of the costs of this online retreat. And finally, if you have any feedback on this retreat, please email us at admin at cbn.sg. We look forward to your valuable feedback so that we can improve our services to you. May the Lord continue to bless you and your families and wish you a blessed Lent and a joyous Easter.